Five Country Close Up for October 16th. Everybody is supervised. I am supervised. The people I have out there are supervised by the government. I supervise them too. It's a constant uh, supervision of everybody. It's it's constant constant vigilance to, to see that the regulations are fulfilled. I think it's good for them. Uh, they've kind of confessed when they've met with their peers there, and they've seen that other people have this problem, and the state is trying to give them a way out besides losing their license. Part of humankind is to have a relationship with the land and nature, and that in this technological industrial age, we should call people back to saying, yes, that relationship is important. I've played trombone all through high school, and I enjoyed playing a lot there. And I enjoy playing, and I don't like it when I'm not playing. Um, I enjoy playing in a performing group, and it's just kind of something I've always done. Hello, I'm Bob Pyle. I'm Twyla Young, and this is Five Country Close-Up. Charlene Peroni is off tonight. Tonight we're going to be looking at a driving school for folks who may be in danger of losing their licenses. And we'll see what goes on behind the scenes of a big university marching band. We'll also find out what the Catholic Rural Life Conference is and why it could play an important role in the future of Iowa's farmland. But first, with soybean harvest nearly over and corn harvest underway, we thought we'd look at a very important aspect of grain marketing. Bob, every year millions of bushels of grain, mostly corn and soybeans, but there are others, make their way by rail, by truck, by river barge out of Iowa. And the price of every bit of that grain has been largely determined by a grain inspector. The inspector's job begins here as the elevator loads out the grain bound for a processing plant or a port. This is the new cooperative elevator in Vincent. On the day we visited here, these folks loaded some 260,000 bushels of corn into a 75-car Chicago Northwestern train. It's bound for a port on the Texas Gulf Coast and eventually export. But before any money changes hands on this cargo, 75 of these seven-pound bags of corn will have been examined, weighed, tested, looked at, smelled, and sorted through. A grain inspector will have graded an entire railroad car on the basis of this sample. The sample is taken by a special machine attached to the loading spout. It is designed to select scientifically a representative bit of grain as it goes into the railroad car. Inspector Todd Tischer says that making sure that the sample is accurate and the grain is handled according to federal regulations is among the more difficult of the inspector's tasks. There are so many regulations and there's so much supervision work we have to do and so much application of regulations that we have to do that in, in trying to keep everybody in line and seeing that everything is done in a, in a standard manner and all the regulations are followed is, is, is difficult. It's difficult to do. There are so many regulations just to know them all, for one thing. Now, well, I'm talking now about uh, automatic sampling at elevators. Uh, the, the, all the regulations that apply to these mechanical samplers that are at these elevators, and the, the check testing of them, and uh, having people trained to go out to these elevators and, uh, and, and handle uh, inspection jobs out there, and make sure these machines are working right, and make sure that we're, that we're getting representative samples from all the cars and make sure that cars are clean, that's, that's always tough. You know, telling elevators that, you know, that car's not clean enough, it's got to be cleaned again. And they're very, uh, the government's very strict in these areas. But away from the noise and grain dust and bustle of the elevator is the testing laboratory. <laughs> With its own noise and dust and bustle. <laughs> Here those samples are divided, and divided, and divided by special gravity-powered copper and brass contraptions that can take what started out as a 3,500 bushel carload 
and turn it into a 125 gram sample that is theoretically at least representative of the entire car load. <laughs> then the testing begins. Half of the sample is stored to be brought out and retested in case an argument ensues over the grade. Some of the grain is tested for moisture by a special machine. Some is weighed to determine the weight per bushel. But most of it ends up in the hands of a federally licensed grain inspector. In the case of the Vincent Elevator soybeans, those hands belong to Bob Wingerson and Todd Tischer, the inspectors at Tischer & Sons Grain Inspection Service. Wingerson and Tischer use very sensitive scales and specially designed sieves but mostly, they use their eyes, their fingers, their noses, and their judgment. I would think that the most arbitrary thing about it is, uh, is picking of damage, which uh, is very difficult and takes a lot of experience, and, and odors are very difficult, because everybody's nose is a little different. And uh, if you have 500 people, you have 500, 500 different opinions on how something smells. The first time you see Bob Wingerson stick his face into a pan of soybeans or corn, it looks a bit strange. But there are things about grain that just can't be determined any other way. Wingerson says a musty smell can tell you that corn has been improperly stored. Maybe it got wet. A sour smell might mean that the corn is old. And, says this man who has been smelling corn and soybeans for 25 years, if there's a dead animal somewhere in that load, this is the way to tell. Well, how do they go about deciding that your nose is, is proper for smelling? Well, they're, they're really, it's just a matter of opinion. And if someone doesn't like the way I've smelled something or some decision I've come up with, or the other inspector, Bob, how, his opinion, then they always have federal appeals they can call and they can try some other noses on the, on the samples. And this is one of the most important things about grain. When you get into, into some odors that are bad, it, it can be very expensive for people. The crew here can turn out more than 300 samples a day, and as Wingerson says, they're always caught in the middle. The government tells them how to do everything, from how much grain to collect to how many times to shake the sieve. And the elevator operators can and do complain about any aspect of the grading process. The money they get for their grain depends on that grade. But Tischer, who forsook a career in geology to take over his father's business, says he's glad he did it. Obviously, you enjoy it. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad it's obvious. <laughs> we all enjoy our work. What, do you, what is it about it that you like? Well, it's, it's, it's got to be done. It's something that has to be done. It's uh, important. And there has to be a disinterested third party to settle these disputes and to come up with these application of these standards. And, and it's just an important function in the marketing of grain. Twyla, can an elevator operator uh, choose the inspector to grade his grain? No, as a matter of fact, inspectors are franchised for a certain area, and if you're an elevator operator, then you're obliged to use the inspector that has the license for your area. That's so that, that uh, an, an operator can't shop around and, and uh, inspectors can't get into the business of giving out good grades in order to get good business. On the other hand, if you don't like the grade that the inspector has given you, then you can appeal that to the Federal Grain Inspection Service and for a fee have it retested. And the uh, people who do this testing are the first to admit that they don't do it ever right all the time, that they make mistakes. In fact, Bob Wingerson says that the only person who doesn't make a mistake is the person who doesn't do anything. You've been up to some things lately, too, Bob. Yeah, Twyla, I'm going back to school. Actually, I've been back to school, but it hasn't been by my own choice. You see, I'm, in what, I'm what the state calls an habitual violator, and I'm going back to school, hopefully, to improve my driving skills and drive safely. Right? What do you it's want not to really a full-fledged school. Actually, it's right? just a class of about 20 or so folks who are in the same boat I'm in, which is if any of us get one or more moving violations in the next six months, like speeding or getting into an accident, we can kiss our licenses goodbye for at least 90 days. To make you appreciate our plight a little more, let's backtrack a little, and I'll show you how I got into this predicament. It happened last August. I was en route back to Ames from Des Moines, trying to make a 6 o'clock deadline. It was 5.30, so I was speeding. Just a little bit, mind you, but enough to get a state trooper with his radar on irritated. The officer pulled me over, wrote me up, adding one more speeding ticket to the other two I had picked up just months before. I'm not the only one to end up in a situation like this. The Iowa Department of Transportation reports that in a 12-month period beginning in September of 1978, more than 9,000 Iowans picked up three or more moving violations, which means a lot of Iowans are facing the threat of having their licenses lifted.
The Iowa Department of Transportation is giving hundreds of Iowans another chance through a program called the Iowa Driver Improvement Course. What is this course all about? Oh, to educate the driver who has problems or a problem uh, to, I don't want to say, slow down and live, uh, take another look at his driving, uh, his driving skills, and uh, how bad he really wants to drive on the Iowa highways. Up until recently, the state didn't bother educating the habitual violator, but that changed last March when the driver improvement course was initiated statewide. Part of it, I think, is good for them. Uh, they've kind of confessed when they've met with their peers there, and they've seen that other people have this problem, and the state is trying to give them a way out besides losing their license. And like tonight, we had a great rapport with the class. Uh, the people enjoyed it. They're starting to tell their experiences. The material covered within the three three-hour sessions isn't earth-shattering. As a matter of fact, it's downright basic. But this basic material could save your life. Well, we have some uh, films. We have a, a group of uh, slide presentation. Uh, we have a booklet to study out of. We have several pamphlets uh, to use. But the most important tool is the people in the class. Uh, they contribute most all the good information. Uh, they contribute their own self and when they really get into it, and like say usually the second or third night particularly, uh, like we had tonight, uh, very good talking back to each other, bringing up questions, bringing up uh, their own uh, anecdotes, their own experiences. Well, <laughs> you don't have your flashers on, you're just sitting there with your lights on or something, the car comes up behind you, just think it's another car moving and he could run right in the back of you just to let him know that it's an emergency situation. I don't want to get caught again, that's for sure. Uh, I think um, even between last week and now, um, whenever I drive, I think about it, believe it or not. It's, it's just uh, something that I don't want to have to go through again. And uh, it's, it's a learning experience. Uh, I don't know about my speed. I will try to keep it down, but uh, it has to make you a better driver. It would be hard to sit in the class and not get anything out of it. When you received the letter that said you have to attend this class, what was your initial, uh, initial feelings, initial reaction? Somewhat shocked, and then I got to thinking about all the tickets that I have gotten, and then I said, well, this is a good alternative besides just getting a letter saying that your license is gone and nothing you could do but wait the duration of the time makes you stop and think about what you really are doing and the hazards on the highway and what you can do to protect your own life as well as others. Instructor Jim Blair says he enjoys teaching the course, but he admits it isn't easy. Many times people walk into the class with a chip on their shoulder. Oh yeah, there's always this grudge. Uh, and I think you remember some of them the first night, maybe you had some. Uh, it really wasn't my fault. I shouldn't be here. Uh, a lot of other people speed, a lot of other people do other things they shouldn't do. Why me? And the hardest job and my, I believe my first job is everybody be friends. We're going to get through this all right together. And when we all get done, we'll be very happy. As to whether the course is effective, Blair says it's too soon to tell. But one thing is for sure, as far as this reporter is concerned, it better be effective. If not, I'll be walking to my next news assignment. Twyla, all I can say is I hope I never see that day. I hope not, too. You had your last, your last class last night. Did you come out of it with any kind of thumbnail sketch of a, sa of a safe driver? Well, Jim Blair, the instructor, uh, mentioned something that kind of stuck in my mind. He, he said, a courteous driver will always be a safe driver, and if all of us drive courteously, the roads would be a whole lot safer. Makes sense. Coming up next, a visit with some church folks who are concerned about the future of farmland.